Well, welcome to all of you, and special welcome to any visitors. As usual, uh, we are very happy to have you at this morning tea and coffee after the service. Um, just one thing I need to mention. Um, please do remember uh, two people in your prayers, and if there are more, uh, let us know that we can also inform others about them. Heather Gray and Edith Lettinen, uh, both are recovering from their uh, operations and operations. Um, as far as I know, they are recovering well, uh, but they do need our prayers. And also other family members who are looking after them and perhaps doing the things they have never done before. <coughs> For instance, maybe cooking meals and uh, also running about for other things. So do remember all of them in your prayers. Let us now begin our worship. Uh, our collective reading is taken from the Book of Psalms. So grab the Bible around you and we are going to read together. I just want to promote this practice so we can all participate at least once in worship. Don't sit on the listen, which is good sometimes, but it's also good to read together God's word and be blessed. So, grab the Bible. Uh, it is on page 555, uh, right about there. Uh, Psalm 34, we are going to read first 14 verses together. So don't wait for me, read first and then. We are all reading together. Okay? <coughs> Let us read together. I will always thank the Lord. I will never stop praising Him. I will praise Him for what He has done. May all who are praised listen and be glad. Proclaim with me the Lord's greatness. Let us praise His name together. I prayed to the Lord and He answered me. He freed me from all my fears. The oppressed look to Him and are glad. They will never be disappointed. The helpless call to Him and He answers. He saved them from all their troubles. His angel guards those who honor the Lord and rescues them from danger. Find out for yourself how good the Lord is. Happy are those who find safety with Him. Honor the Lord all His people. Those who obey Him have all they need. Even lions go hungry for lack of food, but those who obey the Lord lack nothing good. Come, my young friends, and listen to me, and I will teach you to honor the Lord. Would you like to enjoy life? Do you want long life and happiness? Then hold back from speaking evil and from telling lies. Turn away from your evil and be good. Strive for peace with all your heart. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you for this time, the time of worship. The time of sitting together, young and old alike, to offer our worship, to sing your praises, to pray and speak to you, but also expect you to speak to us through your word. We thank you for the assurance that we receive from your word. The lions and their cubs can go hungry, but those who trust you will never lack anything good. And so Lord, with that trust and confidence we come to you, knowing that we are people who always fail to obey you. We always do wrong when we should be doing good. Lord, we thank you that despite all this, you are still there to receive us and to forgive us for the sake of Christ who willingly offered his life in our place and so that we can be reconciled to you. We can come to you with openness, with our thankfulness, so that we can enjoy and rejoice in your presence. This morning, Lord, receive our worship for the sake of Christ who showed us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, 
and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Let us worship God. Our first hymn is taken from Mission Praise, Mission Praise number 528. Oh, worship the King. This is diary, but you can also call it calendar, right? Okay. And this is clock. I think it's the right time. Yes, it is. And there is one more thing that I borrowed this morning. And you never know what you can get from a lady's handbag. This was there, okay? This is inch tape, isn't it? Now, the question is, what is common in all three things? No. Hmm? Yes, please. Yep. They all got numbers on it. That's that's true. That's right. What else? Yes. Come. Uh, they are all similar. Similar. Yes. And what we? Hmm. Yes. Yes. Come. They're all the same length. 
They are so saying that, well, yeah. are they? <laughs> uh -huh. Anybody else? Any guesses? No, that goes beyond the children, okay? Yes. All right, okay. Who wants to guess then? What is common in these three things? That's absolutely right. They're all for measuring, right? What do you measure with this? Boys and girls. Time. Time, that's right. And what do you measure with this? What are you supposed to do, right? Okay, well, yeah, you can write something in it, but if you don't look at it, you don't know what you do. Like someday forget it, you know? Anybody else? Well, with this? You, yes? Uh, what there? What there? That's right, close, yes. Well, basically, you measure in a way, time you measure, you know, year, how long it is what day of month is, what month is it, what week, and so on and so forth. And these things you can measure, with this you can measure how tall I am, and I'm not very tall, right? Uh, no? Well, just leave it, right? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we can measure people, you know, how tall they are, how short they are, how yeah? No word for it? No? Right? Okay? But I think boys and girls, sometimes we do the same with people. We measure our people, we try to get idea of how people are, who they are, by their size, sometimes, how tall they are, sometimes by what they have and what they don't have. For instance, sometimes we look at other people and say, Oh, he's taller than me, or she's taller than me. And she is perhaps prettier than me. And others think that person has more toys than me. And all this measuring thing goes on. It's not only with children, but other people, bigger people, older people as well. He has a better motorbike. And me, yes? Or a better flashy car and TV and so on and so forth. And by this, boys and girls, we then make up our own picture about people. Sometimes, if people don't have enough, we ignore them. And those who have more sometimes, better people, we look up to them and try to then ignore others. And I think sometimes it can create a really a bad, very bad feeling in us. Sometimes it can make us proud, arrogant. Other times it can make us feel so bad about ourselves and self pity and so on and so forth. But the good thing is, world girls, that God doesn't look at us like that. He doesn't look at us whether we are small, whether we are tall, whether we are big or skinny. Whether we have dark hair or light hair, whether we have dark skin or lighter skin, whether we come from different place or we are from here, God doesn't look at that. He invites everybody. He accepts all people. And uh, this is one of the things that the Bible talks about and we take it uh, really, really to heart, and we will do well actually we take it to heart. In our reading today, we will read later on, you know the story of Zacchaeus, don't you? He was a short man, and people hated him because of his work. So he wanted to hide and try always to do things, you know, discreetly. But Jesus found him, and he offered him friendship. And I think each one of us, if we have that kind of feeling, either we feel better, uh, you know, than others, or we feel bad, right, uh, by looking at others. Jesus can accept us all as we are. He can be our friend, and you can be his friend. If we have any kind of concerns, we can take it to him in prayer or 
we can talk to him whenever we want. And that is what we are going to sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. He always invites and takes us as his friends. Okay, can you remember that? Well done. Let's sing together. Then. Although your stains are deep, 
red, you will be as white as wool. Turning to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus and Zacchaeus. Jesus went on into Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief tax collector there named Zacchaeus who was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was a little man and could not see Jesus because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus who was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Hurry down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay in your house today. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people who saw, saw it started grumbling. <coughs> this man has gone as a guest to the home of a sinner. <coughs> Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Listen, sir. I will give half my belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay him back four times as much. Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today, for this man also is a descendant of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Let us once again uh, sing uh, from Mission Place, Mission Place number 750. <laughs> what kind of love is this that gave itself for me?
when we watch TV sometimes, uh, we are watching some program and suddenly something interrupts something uh, that uh, producers uh, deem appropriate uh, and the public's interest, they just interrupt the program and up comes the information and they then say this is, this either is a breaking news or something else. But we all have uh, experienced that time to time. I think the, there are 10 in our reading is something like that. In the text, it suddenly comes and God speaks to people and he asks them, your rulers and your people are like, like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what your God is teaching you. It's like that scene is just on and interruption comes and the new information is given to grab people's full attention. In this passage from Isaiah, the angry voice is the voice of God. The passage talks about what what God thinks of the people of Jerusalem, that is, that is the people of Israel at the time. And this divine speech addressed to, is, is addressed to Israel's leaders, but also to people. So both people in power and common people, they are addressed together and they are asked to pay attention. They are addressed as people of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, it's like, you people <coughs> are citizens of sin cities. That is to grab people's attention. It's like, uh, in our days, to talk about, to say somebody, you are a homophobic, you are a racist. What is such thing to get people's full attention and see the reaction that you get? The prophet identified them as people who are departed from the truth, people who are gone away from God. And when this passage is read within a contemporary faith community, you know, it should be read as a challenge to us, challenge to our own worship practices and not some of somebody else. Because the danger is, the first danger, when we read these passages in the Old Testament, people can think of like these are the verses and addresses aimed at the people in history long time ago. And therefore they are not spoken to us. And many people do that and because of that, many people in our day do not give the Old Testament as much attention as they give to the New Testament. They ignore the Old Testament, partly because they think that is basically addressed or aimed at the people of Israel. That is a gross mistake. The other thing that we can do or people do, the danger is, and as a second danger, you know, before I take up the main theme of this passage, I want to, to make this very important point. You know, while this text majors on justice, the treatment of the oppressed and marginalized, and the conclusion that, you know, people draw from it, because this passage talks about justice, it talks about paying attention to the needs of those who are needy in our communities or in our world, people take this as a, as a chief motive of human life. And that means that the, the social justice replaces the worship. And there are many people in our world who think that they take part in charitable acts they do these charitable things, they talk about justice and fairness, 
And therefore, that is all they need. Don't need any God. They don't need worship. They don't need church. In other words, justice or social justice replaces worship. And that is a very incorrect conclusion. Especially in the light of the whole book of Isaiah. You know, positive images of God's worship and relationship to the temple permeate the whole book of Isaiah. You know, we need to take the passage in its wider context, in the context of the whole book. And so, God saved Jerusalem in Isaiah 36 when King Hezekiah prays in the temple. And a, and a stunning image of inclusiveness, the marginalized foreigners and castrated become fully integrated into the community by the inclusion and worship in Isaiah chapter 56 verses 3 to 5. The book of Isaiah ends with a vision of restoration that lights salvation with temple worship. And you can find that in the last chapter of Isaiah chapter 66. And so Isaiah or these verses that we have just heard or read they don't say worship and that is sacrifices, prayers, addresses, preaching and all other practices are evil in themselves. It doesn't say that they are unnecessary or insignificant. Now Professor Corinne Carvalho says this. She says all these practices were not evil as they were. Instead, the passage invites us to reflect on worship with regards to those who have been oppressed or who are oppressed, who are ignored, who are abandoned. For instance, she goes on to say, what do our hands sound like to someone who lives on the brink of destitution? Do our prayers evoke anger in those who can barely feed their children during the week, the week between Sundays? Does the hope that we preach sound hollow to child who does not feel safe in his or her own neighborhood or in his or her own home? You see, when I choose hands, I don't just choose by flicking the coin. I spent a lot of time in choosing them. But sometimes I choose a hymn that we you are unhappy with because we don't know the, the tune. But bear in mind, I try to balance the worship so that the people in our own community can relate to. Some hymns talk about praising God and rejoicing in His presence. Others talk about our own condition. Maybe we are grieving, or some of us, maybe. So I try to balance that all. I feel miserable at times. But you see, when we worship, we need to think about all people in our midst. Not just those who are happy, and they should be happy, but also those who are not. The problem was not with the practices or the rituals that the text talks about. God himself was in fact the one who instituted these practices in Israel. The problem was with those who were performing these acts of worship. The problem was because the Israelites were worshipping God only with their mouths, as Isaiah says in his first chapter. But their hearts were not in it. 
they sang and they sacrificed and but their heart did not match those feelings they fasted but then they celebrated the festivals but they did not worship their lives did not reflect the heart or true heart of worship look at verse 14 what does it say verse 14 says i hate your new moon festivals and holy days they are a burden that i am tired of bearing you see god was really disgusted with the way people worshiped their worship is obviously you know all for you they may be saying but god responds he says your worship is all about yourself because it is doing nothing for me you know many people sometimes i remember when i was preaching in in one of the churches in pakistan and uh, uh, one of my friends came to me he said well actually we went to that particular church some church i didn't really enjoy worship as my next question was why didn't you enjoy what did you go there to enjoy and then said you know the kind of answer was you know i wanted something more exciting things i wanted kind of entertainment that is so popular in our churches you see worship primarily is for god he is our audience if he doesn't enjoy our worship we are the performers we don't come to enjoy be entertained him to be entertained listen to his response what is the word strength your new festivals and holy days are burdened to me i'm tired of bearing this burden question is what is our worship how do we worship what will be god's response to our worship that is a question we need to think about God says to them what you celebrate is for your own pleasure there is no god in it much like that you know christmas in a time isn't it many people celebrate christmas you ask them what is christmas right blank christmas has become simply a festival and so we take it as a day when we just sit together and have a meal and which is good have family around and friends and that's about it not much thought more than that given to what is the significant event in history now what was lacking in their worship that's a question that the you know the practices and the text talks about that is justice An Old Testament professor called Professor Limburg has investigated the occurrences of the word worship that's in Hebrew mishpat and shafat that's to do justice and he has investigated the prophetic books and also the whole all the whole Old Testament what struck him was that most of the context of biblical justice talk about the same kind of people and they are widows orphans the poor sometimes there was also the immigrants or the senior citizens of our time you know aged people just as it was clear to him had to do with these people and so when we talk about biblical justice it is not simply about equality or only fairness that is what we understand about justice in our day you know everybody has the same thing biblical justice is different hebrew proverbs have the images 
of justice which are quite different. They are first of all dynamic. You know, biblical justice is dynamic. Amos pictures justice as a surging, roaring, rolling, cleansing river. He says, let justice roll down like rivers. Micah called about his people to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Guild had that theme a few years ago, I think. Isaiah points out that doing justice is a grateful response of a people for whom God has already done much. In other words, it's a response. And so, those who are blessed respond in justice. And so if it is a dynamic justice, it is not a static justice. It is, it is an active justice. Isaiah calls his haters to be advocates of the powerless, taking up the cause of the powerless. Which means the widows, the orphans, those who are hopeless and helpless, those who are poor in our midst. This, to have that kind of act of justice, would require firstly to reform our laws which discriminate against the powerless. You know? And there is much institutional discrimination even in this country. And so God says, says to, to Israel which were doing the same thing, He says, you know, <coughs> take active part in it. And being proactive in programs designed to help the helpless, the helpless, the homeless and the hopeless. And you can include some other lessons in it. God speak what we are refused to hear. God's anger is the anger of those we fail to see. <coughs> and so God called us on our lack of activism for the oppressed and our failure to find relief for the oppressed. And second thing is, First, it needs reforms in our laws and we can take part in it as we vote. Secondly, this kind of reform can only take place if there is a change in our attitude. Our second reading talks about that. When Jesus met Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector, people, person who was hated, and perhaps thought that even God hated him. When he faces Jesus and he has you know, meeting with Jesus, he, you know, Zacchaeus learned that the, the, the Son of Man, Lord Jesus Christ, had actually come to seek the lost, those who are the losers he has come to save. And with that, his life changed. And for him, step one was to look at the way he was dealing with people. And he returned half of his wealth, and four times to those he had defrauded. Jesus didn't ask him for anything, but Zacchaeus offered to give it to the poor. And why did he do that? You see, when we are truly thankful, when we are truly thankful people, it will be expressed in our worship. It will be expressed in our attitude. Our giving to the church is a way less than our living standard. Is it not true? The attitude has to change and when we have properly known a God who has graciously given his own son, Jesus Christ, we can enter into worship of him. That's the first key to experiencing a worship renewal. For Christians, as we are, it is also the realization 
how we have been treated by God. As Paul said, while we were still sinners, separated from God, Jesus died for us. That means, when we had no rights, no merit for kindness, no reason to be loved, and yet God loved. Found us when we were lost. Showed mercy when we were unworthy. If we begin to understand that, what Jesus has done for us, we would want to respond in the same way. The thing that we said, said, what kind of love is this? That gave itself for me, I am the guilty one, and yet I go free. What kind of love is this? Sin that we are going to sin. As we uplift the offering, is the known one. And this is the hymn that talks about what we need to realize. It says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I was blind, but now I see. When we realize that, what is done for us, our response would be to worship God, to treat people as He wants us to. May God enable us to do so. Let us now uplift the offering as we sing Amazing Grace. <coughs> you have saved us when we were lost. It is this amazing grace that challenges us to come and to offer our worship to you. To realize that when we were unworthy, when we did deserve, you gave your all. And so Lord, help us to also be sensitive and be proactive towards justice, the act of justice, 
which demands to love those who are love un unworthy, who are unlovable. To be kind to those who are harsh towards us. To be gracious to those who are unkind to us. And this we want to express in our worship community. And so Lord, we recognize that we fail at times, but we thank you for your spirit who convicts us, who brings us back, uh, back into your fellowship. And this morning we thank you for your challenge, but also we thank you that we are not alone to do this. The second helper, the Holy Spirit that you have given us, will enable us to carry out your will in our lives. Lord, help us to respond to your love. Our little response in terms of our offerings are here before you and we ask you to receive it, bless it, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us now conclude our service by expressing our hope in Christ alone. Mission praise number 473. My hope is built on nothing less. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. <laughs>